Hello. Welcome to Dominion Life Now. I'm Curry Blake, your host for the program, and we're going to get right in the Word of God. As usual, we like to spend as much time as we can in the Word of God and getting this information to you. Uh, we do want to remind you that uh, during the entire month of February, uh, we are in South Africa. Uh, we have settled the dates, and we're at uh, Spirit Word Ministries down in Stillfontein, February 3rd to the 5th. We're going to be uh, the next week after that, I believe the 9th through the 11th, we will be in Springs at the AFM Church, Jesus is Light. And so we're going to be conducting meetings there. We're going to be in Cape Town. We're going to be in pro probably in Durban. I'm not sure about that one yet. But uh, we're also going to be ministering in homes and on the streets. And so we're going to have a great time uh, during the month of February there. And we're looking forward to setting things up and getting some life teams established and getting some people involved so that we can set these things up in the future so that we can start ministering there uh, on a more, uh, on a longer time period, put that away. We're, we're planning on actually uh, being there up to three months at a time and then even longer after that because we want to come and do our Dominion Bible Institute. We want to get that established and set there, not just online as it is now, but get it set uh, on site and have Dominion Bible Institute campuses throughout South Africa. So uh, if when we get there, if you want to talk to us about that, let us know. You can email us and let us know even beforehand. But uh, we are going to be establishing these things there. So we look forward to what God has planned. So let's get in the Word of God. Now, to this week, and I want to welcome you to this week's studies, and we're going to start this week by giving you some, as we would say, just the nuts and bolts of this thing. You know, um, one of the things that JGLM, John Jack Ministries, is known for is that we teach people how to. We don't just preach. We, we give you the how to actually do this. We share with you, you know, really we tell people all the time, we don't have any secrets. We are sharing everything we've got. We're helping to equip. Uh, if God speaks it to us, we speak it to you. And so we try to make sure that we're not holding anything back. Uh, you know, as Miles Monroe used to say, uh, we want to die empty. We don't want to die with an extra book still in there or extra information or a secret or anything. We don't want that. We want you to get it, and we that's why we're doing these programs. It made it an easier way to reach more people faster. It's the only reason we're doing it. So... Uh, Right now, in the, probably for at least a couple of broadcasts, we're going to be covering some of the, you know, as I said, the nuts and bolts of healing. And we're going to be looking at this because this is the question we get. You know, no matter what I teach, no matter where I go, uh, if I take questions, and I always do, whenever we do seminars or anything else, I always take questions from the audience. And every time I do, I could be teaching on the new man. I could be teaching on, you know, prophecy. I could be teaching on uh, finances. And if I said, who's got questions, the questions are going to be about healing. That's just the way it is. And and I don't mind that a bit because, uh, you know, God has answered the cry of my heart that we would bring forth the truth concerning divine healing. And so I don't mind that a bit. We are known for healing. We'll always be known for healing because that is the thing that God first gave us revelation on that actually shifted everything and has actually uh, birthed uh, most of the street healing ministries that you know of and different things that are going on. Uh, we started that, you know, 20, 30 years ago whenever we started ministering on the streets and taking the power of God out there. So now, well, but there are times whenever there are nuggets, we would call them, just little things that can help, uh, you know, fine tune what you're doing. And so there's just some stuff I want to share with you uh, that we have here that I, 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 I'm just going to bring it to you. And we're calling this the ABCs of a divine healing ministry. The ABCs of a divine healing ministry. Now, the reason we're saying that, and <clears throat> understand, it's because it is as easy as ABC. It's very easy, and it's uh, one of the things I love about God is how uh, faithful He is, how predictable He is in most ways, and that He is very consistent. And so because of that, uh, people would almost say that he is mechanical in the way that things work and the way he does things. You know, every day we get up to the alarm clock or whatever it is, and the reason we can do that and reason all of our alarm clocks match, you know, in, a, in any given area is because God set the solar system up so that it operates down to the millisecond. And because of that, uh, we can look at how things are going to be and we can know exactly what time the sun's going to come up, you know, five years from now. And so... God's power 
having set that in motion, it shows how mechanical his power is. Now, a lot of people don't like that, and it's true. Uh, whenever you see how mechanical it is, yes, you could actually operate in his power without having the relationship with him that most people think you would have to have, which exactly goes opposite of what most people teach about the power of God because they emphasize that you know, to have the power of God, you've got to have this close, intimate relationship. And it's funny because they always seem like they have that relationship, but they really don't tell you how to get it. They just act like they got it. And unfortunately, most people, if you ask them, what is your relationship with God like? They would almost everybody always says, well, it's good, but it could be better. I could spend more time praying. I could do this more. And so there's always that idea of not quite good enough or along those lines. And whenever you make a relationship with God the key factor to walking in power, then automatically people will cut themselves out because they always think that somebody else's relationship with God is better than theirs. And I'm here to tell you, you should walk with God. You ought to know God. You ought to spend time talking with him, uh, communing with him. But he does not give you power based on how close you are to him. There are people I know that are very close to God. I mean, they know God, they love God, and they believe in the power of God, but they don't walk in power. And so it's just not a matter of the relationship to, um, you know, the, the um, how can I say it, the corollary of the relation, your relationship with God does not equal the degree of power you walk in. The degree of power that you walk in is according to the power that works in you. It is according to that power in you, and that power is faith. That power is the Holy Spirit. And when you mix faith with the Holy Spirit, you get a divine chemical reaction that is explosive. It is a dynamic relationship then. And so we want to talk about this today. So let's get into it. We call this the ABCs of a divine healing ministry. And first off, because we call it the ABCs, we're going to run with that. We're going to say, we're going to go through the beginning letters of the alphabet. We're going to go through the A, the B, and the C, and the D, I don't know if we get to E, but there's, I could actually go through the whole alphabet. But the first one, of course, is A. So the first thing you need is A, and that is availability. If God is going to use you to heal the sick, you have to be available. That means that you have to be willing to step out. You have to be willing to be available whenever he needs you. Uh, whenever you see someone, you have to be the person that's available. Now, there's two parts to A. There has to be availability, and there has to be action. Okay, God can't use you to heal the sick if you won't take action, if you won't step up, if you won't step out, we might say. Now, I'm going to give you some scriptures, and we're going to go through them, and we, we're going to have to go through them fairly quickly. But I'm just going to give you just some basic scriptures. All of these you've probably heard before. But uh, the first one is Second Chronicles 16, 9. That's Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong, in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein, now, now notice this, I'm, I'm going to stop right here, I'm going to run back to this. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. So God is looking, it's going, it, and notice, it's constant, runs to and fro, it's constantly. The eyes of the Lord are constantly looking because he wants to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Now, notice that is not saying who walk perfect, who don't make mistakes. It says whose heart is perfect. Now, that a perfect heart is simply the heart of the person who loves God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. They're, they're, they're toward God. They're loving God. They're doing what they know to do, and they're looking for what they can do to show their love to God. So if that is you, then God, <clears throat> the eyes of the Lord, run to and fro over the whole face of the earth looking for you. Why? Because he is looking to help you. And now look, he is looking to show himself strong. God wants to show himself strong in your behalf. That means when you reach out and you lay hands on the sick, he wants to show himself strong in that and heal that person right then, right in front of you. That's what he wants. Now, I will tell you this. Whenever you lay hands on the sick, especially in the public, especially based on Mark 16, that as a believer, you're going to lay hands and it's going to be a sign to those around. That means mainly to do it out in public, not in a church service. It works there too. But it, it's mainly talking about as a sign to unbelievers. When you're doing that, 
when you're stepping out and you're laying hands on them, one of the things you need to make sure that you do is that you tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you and then lay hands on them. Right? Now, what that means is this. You're doing it as a demonstration. That means you don't mind everybody around watching. That means that you're doing it on purpose to draw attention. Signs draw attention. Don't let people tell you, oh, you're just doing that to draw attention. Yes, you are, but not to yourself, but to God. And if you let your light shine before men that they will see your good works, they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. So don't let the devil speak through you know, hard-hearted uh, religious people and get you to back off of ministering to people in the street or in public places because they tell you you're just trying to be seen. You need to be seen. Your light needs to be shown and people need to see your good works so that they will glorify your Father in heaven. Now, remember, you're not doing this so you can be somebody. You're not doing this so you can be the next guy, you know, the next YouTube fad and, uh, you know, be the next guy with a big ministry that comes out of it or gathers a following. You're doing it to help people. You're doing it to set the captives free. You're doing it to draw attention to God and to glorify Him. Now, as long as you keep your mind in those areas and you start declaring the kingdom of God has come near to you, so be healed in Jesus' name right now. Rise up and walk right now. Get out of that wheelchair right now. Drop those crutches. When you start doing that, you watch. God will show himself strong on your behalf. Why? Because your heart is perfect toward him. If you love Jesus, you love God, you love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing to them. And here's how you say, well, I'm just not sure I love my neighbor as myself. Well, if you're reaching out and helping people that need help, people you don't even know, but you're reaching out to help them, that is loving your neighbor as yourself. You know, one of the things, um, we're getting these other scriptures too, because we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 next. <clears throat> One of the things that we always hear along these lines is whenever people say, well, you know, um, well, in churches, what do you hear most taught on in churches? Love. They're always preaching about love, which is, I guess, good. Uh, you know, people need to do it more than just talk about it. But they always talk about this love. And really, in many churches, the idea of love moves more toward the new age than toward the Bible. And because the new age idea of love is everything's okay, everybody's okay, everything is fine, uh, you know, don't, don't ever judge, don't ever, you know, differentiate between this, don't look at that and go, that, that's not godly, that is, but that's not. See, that new age would say, oh, no, you don't do that. Everything's good, everybody has their own path. No, 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 They're, everybody doesn't have their own path. Uh, there's one path, and that's Jesus. And so we need to realize that and we need to move back to what real love is. Jesus said, if you want the greatest kind of love, that's simple. Lay down your life for a friend. You just lay down your life. No greater love hath any man than this, that he lay down his life for a friend. And then he showed us how to do that. Not just on the cross, but in his daily life. What did he do? He laid down his life daily. Why? He, he went out. He gave himself to the people. He helped them. He met their needs. He did what was needed. He wasn't doing that for him. He was doing that for them. He was laying down his life. He could have been doing anything. He was, he was born to be a king. He could have said, no, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to sit in that throne. I'm going to be king. And I don't have to do any of this because I was born a king. I don't have to go try to be a king. I am a king. He didn't do that. He said, I'm here to show you how you should live. You should do to others what you want done to you. And then he laid down his life by doing to others what he would want done for him. That's what he did. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why? For God was with him. And he was just doing what he commanded us to do. So you need to be available, but you also need to proclaim the kingdom is at hand as you minister to people. See, that was one, one little thing right there. Uh, whenever I was talking with a, uh, I taught at a local Bible school, and I shared with them the divine healing truths. And as I did, they got a hold of it, and it was working for them. And then afterwards, I left, and the, that, that uh, class graduated. And then when a new class came in, they passed on some of the same information, and they were getting some results, but it wasn't as good as before. So that teacher of that school called me and said, what's going on? We know this works. We saw it. Why isn't it working like it was? And I said, well, just take me through. What are you doing? And whenever you go out on the streets, how are you doing the healing? How, how do, what are you saying? What are you doing? 
and he went through it and I said Here, here's something that you're missing you need instant results so that means you can't go out and say well just pray and believe and you'll see it in a week or two you push for instant and I said so you need to put a demand you might say on the kingdom you needed to say what Jesus said he said when you go you heal the sick and you say unto them the kingdom of God has come near you now when he said that too he said you go into a city and you proclaim to them the kingdom of God has come near to you and then you heal the sick I said so that's the part that you're not doing whenever you told me what you were doing you left that part out he said yeah we we haven't been doing that I said add that in just start just that little thing right there add that in and call me back let me know how it goes and so they started doing that and instantly he said the results were right back there he said we started expecting right then we started putting the demand on it we started proclaiming the kingdom and showing the gospel of the kingdom and so uh, that's one of the little keys one of the little nuggets that you need to know now it's not a formula it's not just the words that you're saying but you are proclaiming announcing the kingdom of God is at hand so the first is availability. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. It starts by saying, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed. Now watch this. He said here, now, now get, you got to get this. All of this is in one verse here. Actually two uh, total. But verse 8 says, I, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Now notice, they didn't spend two years at the altar crying out, Send me, Lord, oh, send me, oh, please send me. No. Then the next verse says, And he said, Go. Believe me, whenever you say, Lord, send me, God says, Go, right then. He, does, he doesn't say, Well, hang on, hang on, just wait. No, just wait. No, whenever you're ready to cry out, send me, immediately he answers back and says, go. You go and you do this. Now, I've heard people just recently say that very thing. Oh, I heard the voice of the Lord say, send me. And then they started crying, send me, Lord. Yes, send me. Please send me, Lord. And they don't even see the next part of that. They're quoting that verse, but they don't even see the next part. And we need to realize that Jesus has already said, go. He said, you are to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, do all this. He said, these signs will follow you if you believe but he said go and so there is not a person on this earth that is waiting on an answer from God to go God has already said go he sent Jesus to say go you never see him say wait matter of fact the closest Jesus ever got to that was he said wait until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit the promise of the Father that I'll send and when you receive him you will become witnesses you'll become witnesses to me throughout Judea uh, Samaria, Jerusalem, everywhere through Israel, all through and throughout the whole world. So he's already said go. He's just waiting on you to be ready to go. And the minute you say, I'm ready, he says, all right, here's, here's where I want you to go. And it might be just right out your front door. It might be the person next door, the next door neighbor. It might just be somebody at the grocery store. It might be another country. He might want you to go around the world. And so well, if you say send me, believe me, he's already saying go. So don't think that you're waiting on him to send. You know, I've known so many people uh, that as I came up in church and that kind of thing and been around church people, I've known so many people uh, that have been in church all their life and then they start praying about, well, God, I need to, I, I think I should be in the ministry. So God, send me in the ministry. God, you open the door, you know, provide a church and I'll go pastor a church or something. Who, who said that's the path? You know, that's just the typical path that we know of today because we're in this church system. But I can tell you right now, that's not what God was saying. And I, most of those people, there's a particular person I'm thinking of even right now that I knew 30 years ago. And whenever I first launched out, started going out, started doing the works of Jesus, uh, I went around the world by that time like two or three times before I saw this person again. And it was a good 10, 12 years later that this person was in the church where I started. And whenever, even before I started, we used to talk and he would say, yeah, I'm just waiting on the Lord to open a door. Just waiting for him to open a door. And 10 to 12 years later, I went back to that church and visited. And guess what? That same person was still sitting there. And I met him and I said, man, how you been doing? He said, well, I've been hearing things about you. It's good. I hear you going all over the world. I said, yep, we've gone around the world about three times now. 
And I say, what's going on with you? Well, you know, I'm just still waiting on the Lord. I'm just still waiting on him to open those doors. And literally, I got mad inside. I, I didn't show it. I, did, I wasn't mean toward him or anything. But I'm so fed up with church teaching people that kind of garbage that he's just supposed to sit there in church and wait 10, 12 years and not launch out, not step out, not do anything. And if he had just stepped out, then the next door would have opened and then he would have stepped into that and then the next door would have opened and the next door and it would have kept going until he was doing what God had fully called him to do. But he was waiting for the big door to open and for him to launch out in that way and somehow God was going to do that. That's not how it is. Faith, the kingdom, everything starts as a seed. Everything starts from the beginning with the smallest step, with the first action. You know, even the Chinese have a proverb that says that the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step and so we need to realize god is waiting on you you're not waiting on god now people say well you know i've heard we're supposed to wait on god well there is an aspect in your spirit where you are waiting on god in the sense that you are waiting uh before him and that you're listening and that you're ready to do whatever he says that's what it's talking about it's not talking about you sitting down and propping up your feet and saying well whenever god shows up then i'll do something no that's not waiting on god you're, it's not like you're waiting on a visitor to come to your house what it is is that you're waiting see the waiting on god that's biblical is you are busy about your father's business and as you're busy about your father's business he's busy opening up that next door he's busy getting your path ready and aligning things up so you need to realize you're not waiting on god he's waiting on you availability that's the first one availability availability <laughs> just go off into tongues maybe that'd be better but availability and action you got to put those two things together you got to be available and you got to put in put action into place and so that's the first two now there's one more here very quickly Ezekiel 22:30 Ezekiel 22:30 and it says there and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it now God here is talking as a magistrate as a uh, a ruler as a judge you might say and he's saying look legally this is what I have to do because of what the people are there are doing there but if I can get somebody to stand in the gap and ask me not to do it, then I will have reason not to do it. That's the way this works. And so he says, I'm looking for a man. He said, as he sought a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap. And he said, but I found none. And so that's what we need availability. We need to be the person that will stand in the gap. How do we do that? It's not that you're going to this sick person and standing between them and God and saying, okay, God, I'm shielding them so that this, this thing, so that you won't destroy them. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you standing in the gap and saying, God, you see this person? I know that Jesus died for this person. I know he bore their stripes uh, so that he bore their diseases by his stripes. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I'm standing in that gap and I'm protecting this person from the enemy, from the devil, not from God. Listen, let me tell you, if you wanted to, if God wanted to do something, you're not going to be able to stop him. You understand that? But you can stop the devil. Why? Because God has given you permission to stand in the gap and to stop the works of the devil. Now, Ezekiel, the final one, Ezekiel 3.18 says, 3.18 through 21, actually, we're not going to read it all. But he says the same thing. And in that one, he says that if you don't warn the wicked and have them turn from their ways, their blood is on your hands. Now, now get that. This isn't condemnation. This is just saying if you know something and you don't share it, then you're responsible for the people that are destroyed because of the answer that you had that you held back. So you need to share what you're learning. That's Listen, these programs, they're not free to me. I'm paying for them. And so we're paying good money as we'd say for these programs you're not paying for them you what we're doing we're giving this to you freely and as you have freely received you need to go out and freely give we're not demanding that you pay anything or anything else this is all freely we are giving and freely you are receiving so now you need to freely give to those around you you need to be available and you need to get busy working for god Amen. All right. Well, I got to let you go. I do want to remind you, we are going to be, as I said, in uh, South Africa the entire month. 